everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Amal Latou from University of Maryland School of Medicine. And my thanks also to Haney Malamut for giving me this opportunity to join his wonderful conference and have this opportunity to talk about, I think, a really, really important and fun topic and critical knowledge for all of us in acute care medicine. And that is, what do you look for on the post-arrest 12-lead ECG? We've got about 12 or 13 minutes, so let's go ahead and jump right in with a sample case. Let's say you're working in the emergency department. You've got a 55-year-old man who comes to the emergency department, and he's complaining of some concerning chest pain. His vital signs are relatively stable to start with. You get him in the room, you get him on a monitor, and he starts breaking out in a sweat. Now, you're probably seeing some other patients in the meantime, but the nurse tells you that he starts clutching his chest, and as you're heading over to the room to see what's going on, he becomes unresponsive. You run into the room now and you look up at the monitor and what you see is ventricular fibrillation. Well, no problem, right? Because we know what to do with this. This is basic ACLS. This is like what you learn as an intern. We're going to rapidly initiate ACLS maneuvers. We're going to defibrillate this patient. We're going to do good quality CPR. This is probably not good quality CPR, but we're going to do good quality chest compressions, maybe a dose or two of epinephrine. And let's say that after a couple of rounds of ACLS, you get his pulses back, you get return of spontaneous circulation, he's still unconscious, but your vital signs are hanging out okay. Let's say his blood pressure is not too bad, 115, 120 or so, but you're not out of the woods. This is not a talk about post-resuscitation care, so we're not going to go through all the different things you're going to do with them now, but at the very least, one of the things that you're going to do post-rest is get a 12-lead ECG, and that's what we're here to talk about. What is it that you're looking for on that post-arrest 12-lead ECG? Well, I'm sure everybody out there is going to be looking for signs of ischemia. Not just ischemia, but is it a STEMI or is it not a STEMI? That might help in terms of determining which path you're going to go. We're all secretly hoping it's a STEMI so that we can ship the patient upstairs and get them out of our busy emergency apartment wash our hands of the patient, let cardiology take care of the patient at that point. And if it's not a STEMI, we've got some other medical management things to worry about. The other thing that we're going to be looking for is signs of dysrhythmias. Now, for the most part, if you just follow basic standard ACLS, you're going to know what to do and you're going to do things right with regards to those arrhythmias. But there are a couple of curveballs that get thrown at us in terms of what we think we're supposed to do based on ACLS and what ends up actually being dangerous according to, well, following ACLS that we, we are going to do. So let's jump into this. First of all, ischemia versus no ischemia. If the patient has a post-arrest STEMI, no doubt that patient's going for cath. We don't need to spend time on that. This has been part of the guidelines for 10 years, class 1A intervention. If somebody has a post-arrest STEMI, we're shipping up, up to the cath lab as quickly as possible. What if, on the other hand, the patient doesn't have evidence of a STEMI? The patient has non-ST elevation ACS. Are you going to activate the cath lab? Well, for a long time, uh, maybe eight, nine, ten years, a lot of people were advocating that all of these patients, even without the ST segment elevation, should go for cath. But now we have some pretty good literature indicating that if the patient doesn't have evidence of ST elevation infarction on that 12 lead, they probably don't need to go for cath immediately. There's a few randomized studies and there's more randomized studies that are coming out indicating that if a patient doesn't have ST elevation, they're probably better served by just focusing on medical management, keeping them in the emergency department, in the ICU, and then maybe a day or two later then, if they're still doing okay, then they go for a cath. This is the COACT trial, which really opened up our eyes to this concept of delaying the cath when there's no ST elevation. This is the Tomahawk study and then the Emerge study. There's a couple of others that have come out. These are the big randomized studies, and I'm not going to go through these in detail. But again, this has helped in terms of distinguishing whether we send the patient immediately for the cath or whether we focus on medical management and maybe consider delayed cath. There's a, another important point to keep in mind, which probably hasn't received enough attention that I want to let everyone know about. There's at least a couple of studies that have come out indicating that during the first 8, 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes post-arrest, almost all of these patients will have a lot more ischemia on the 12-lead ECG than what's actually going on. These couple of studies I just showed you indicated that post-arrest, after patients receive shocks and or epinephrine, 
they can have a lot of ischemia on the 12 lead for about the first eight minutes or so. Now, in my experience, sometimes these ischemic findings on 12 leads can last 20 or 30 minutes. These studies say that for the first eight minutes, the EKG is going to overestimate the amount of ischemia that's going on. So you should consider repeating the EKG at that point. For me, I'm oftentimes getting the repeat EKG after about 20 minutes or so. Now, I'm not telling you that if you get a post-arrest EKG in the first five minutes after the return of spontaneous circulation and you see STEMI, that you should just sit on the patient for another 15 minutes. You want to go ahead and activate the cath lab at that point, go right ahead. But what I will tell you is that for about the first 10 to 20 minutes, that initial ECG oftentimes will overestimate the amount of ischemia. So I oftentimes will repeat the 12 lead about 20 minutes after we get pulses back. And that's the 12 lead that I'm going to use to determine whether they go immediately to the cath lab or we're going to focus on medical management. That's just my take on the literature. But if you want to send them to the cath lab early, then you go right ahead. Just be aware of these studies. All right, let's switch over and talk about dysrhythmias. If you don't see signs of ischemia, STEMI versus no STEMI, but instead we're looking at ischemia, what are the things that you've got to think about? I mentioned already that standard ACLS often works, but there's a couple of caveats or curveballs that you need to keep in mind. Wide complex tachycardias are not always VTAC. Uh, in fact, there's a couple of mimics of VTAC that you need to be aware of. Typically, when what looks like VTAC is a little bit too slow or a little bit too wide, you've got to think outside of the VTAC box. And then the other caveat I'll put down here that we're not going to have time for, but it's just a simple point here is whenever you get that 12 lead after the patient's pulses come back, take a look at the QT. And if the patient has a long QT or if they were in torsade, and long QT being defined as over 500 milliseconds, on the QTC, it's over 500 milliseconds on the QTC. Stay away from antiarrhythmics. Stay away from lidocaine, procainamide. Stay away from amiodarone because those are going to make the QT even worse and potentially put your patient into persistent torsade. So be wary of what antiarrhythmics you're using. And if there's ever what appears to be torsade or prolonged QT, I'm staying away from those uh, type one type of antiarrhythmics. Now let's talk about these VTAC mimics. And first of all, we probably need to define ventricular tachycardia. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, VTAC is generally defined as a regular wide complex tachycardia without a consistent PQRS, 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 PQRS association. In other words, it's not sinus tach. So there's no clear cut PQRS association. But the one part of the VTAC definition that I think most people don't learn is that in order to diagnose VTAC, you really ought to have a rate of at least 120 to 130. If the rate is less than that, there's a really good chance it's not VTAC, it's more likely a mimic of VTAC. And if you give that patient amio, lidocaine, procainamide, any of your typical type 1 antiarrhythmics, which are all sodium channel blockers, you just might kill the patient. Because those patients with what looks like VTAC, but the rate's less than 120 or 130, oftentimes are hyper-K or sodium channel blocker toxicity, like a tricyclic overdose, or accelerated idioventricular rhythm, which is essentially just an escape rhythm, which is a little bit faster than the typical 20 to 40 that we expect with the ventricle. If you have this ventricular escape rhythm that's anywhere from 40 up to 120, 130, that's called an accelerated ventricular escape rhythm or accelerated idioventricular rhythm, AIVR. And if you give those patients amulidocaine, procainamide, and suppress the escape rhythm, you're left with this rhythm that looks like this. It's called asystole. You'll kill them. So be very careful about ever overcalling VTAC when the rate is slower than 120 or 130. And also when the width of the QRS complex is greater than 200 milliseconds, oftentimes that's not VTAC either. Now it's possible, but usually the vast majority of cases of VTAC will have rate, will have a uh, QRS width under one big box, under 200 milliseconds. And those oftentimes are the same deal. Those oftentimes are hyper-K, uh, sodium channel blocker toxicity, or severe metabolic acidosis. And again, if you give those patients amio, lidocaine, or procainamide, you just might kill them. Let me show you some examples here. Take a look at this. The computer's trying to fool you by calling this VTAC, but what's the rate here? It looks like VTAC, right? 
but the rate here is 105. What does that mean? It can't be VTAC. Unfortunately, this patient was given VTAC and went right into asystole. This is the rhythm strip uh, after the patient got lidocaine. This is too slow for true VTAC. Be very careful. This turned out to be hyperkalemia. By the way, hyperkalemia is a sodium channel poison. And so the last thing you want to do is give them more sodium channel poison called lidocaine or amyo or procainamide. When in doubt, try a little bicarb, try a little calcium, and you'll see the QRS narrow right in front of your eyes. And that will tell you it's not VTAC because VTAC won't narrow in response to bicarb or calcium. Are you going to hurt the patient by giving bicarb or calcium? Really not. So when in doubt, try that. Here's another one. This looks for all the world like VTAC, doesn't it? But the rate here is 110. What does that mean? It can't be ventricular tachycardia. This patient also got lidocaine and ended up going right into asystole dead. I'm showing you some terrible outcomes here. Learn from our mistakes so you don't make these mistakes also. Here's a post-STEMI patient who got thrombolytics. Oftentimes after getting thrombolytics, the patient has a short run of what looks like VTAC, but the rate here is 115. What does that mean? It can't be VTAC. This is nothing more than that accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Unfortunately, the cardiology fellow thought this was VTAC, gave the patient amiodarone, and put the patient right in asystole. The patient died. Another iatrogenic death. Now take a look at this. This is not just what I refer to as a wide complex tachycardia, but I refer to this as a really wide complex tachycardia. What do I mean by that? Take a look at how wide these QRS complexes are. These are greater than one big box, greater than 200 milliseconds. VTAC normally doesn't get that wide. So when you see what looks like VTAC that's getting that wide, you've got to think about tox and metabolic conditions. And that means you stay away from lidocaine, amyo, or procainamide. Unfortunately, this patient got amiodarone and went right into asystole. And this turned out to be hyperkalemia. It's another common mimic of VTAC. But this is so wide. When in doubt, a little bicarb and calcium is never going to hurt. And if you give that bicarb calcium and it narrows right in front of your eyes, you've got your diagnosis. Here's a pre-hospital case. They thought this was VTAC. Take a look. Look at how wide that is. These are, this is just too wide, in my opinion, for VTAC. I'm going to try some calcium or bicarb first. Unfortunately, this patient got amiodarone and about four minutes into the bolus, Brady down and died, could not be resuscitated. Take a look at this pre-hospital case. Look at how wide these QRS complexes are. Look, heart rate 116. It's too wide and it's too slow for VTAC. They thought it was VTAC. They gave the patient some amiodarone and on arrival, the patient is widening out. And as soon as we got the patient into stretcher, cardiac arrest, and the patient died. Again, another iatrogenic death. This turned out to be a TCA overdose. The last thing you want to give to somebody with poison sodium channels is more sodium poison. Now, when in doubt, a little calcium and bicarb is not going to hurt. I know ACLS is not big on calcium or bicarb, but this is the time to really consider it. Take a look at this. The computer's saying cannot exclude VTAC. Well, you know what? Yes, we can. It's too slow for VTAC. And so, Two of my colleagues, Dr. Manning and Dr. Friedman, said, you know, this is awfully slow for VTAC, even though the computer's calling it VTAC. It's also awfully wide for VTAC. You know what? Let's just try a little bicarb. So what they did was they just tried one amp of sodium bicarb, and about a minute after that one amp of bicarb, QRS narrows, and you've got your diagnosis. This turned out to be hyperkalemia. What would have happened if they treated this as ventricular tachycardia by giving lidocaine or amyo or procainamide? This is what would have happened, dead. And then here's a very nice second case. This was a young woman who came in obtunded. Once again, note the heart rate. Heart rate here was 117. What does that mean? It means this cannot be ventricular tachycardia. It's too slow. So what did they do? They gave two amps of bicarb, rapid push, rapid push. And immediately after the second amp, P waves miraculously reappear. And a couple of hours later, they found her empty bottle of Elevil, a tricyclic, and a suicide note. This was a tricyclic overdose. What would have happened if they gave her procainamide or amyo or lidocaine? She'd be dead. All right. Quick take home points here. Number one, post arrest DKGs, you're looking for ischemia. Remember, if it's a STEMI, they're off to the cath lab. If it's not a STEMI, there's a lot more evidence now for a delayed cath, but be wary that for about the first 10 to 20 minutes after you get the pulses back, their EKG will overestimate 
the ischemia on the EKG. So you might consider delaying any decisions until that 20 minute EKG. All right. It's up to you, but there's evidence suggesting that may be a reasonable thing to do. And then in terms of dysrhythmias, be on the lookout for these mimics of VTAC. When the rate's too slow or when the QRS is too wide, consider one or two amps of bicarb, consider some calcium. It just might save a life. But if you jump to the diagnosis of VTAC and you give them amyl or lidocaine or procainamide, you just might kill these patients. And that's what makes these post-arrest EKGs very tricky sometimes. You've got to pay attention. And ACLS is not always going to lead you in the right direction. All right, folks, thanks for your time. And I look forward to talking to you at the Q&A panel.